Dr. Neil, what is musical ear syndrome and what are the causes? Well, musical ear syndrome is a term that I coined back in about 2007. And it is when people hear phantom sounds, but they, they sound so real, most of the time they can't tell whether it's real or not. And a lot of times it's musical sounds. They'll hear what sounds like a TV playing in another room, a radio in another room, a choir singing, uh, maybe sounds from uh, next door, the next door neighbor have the music on too loud. And it's all in the person's head. It's totally, totally phantom. Now, most people, all they have as a frame of reference, if you hear, quote, voices, you are crazy. The proper term is mentally ill. You have a, a, a problem. But older people, when we were young, for example, myself, you know, we talk about, you know, the white coats are coming for you, you're, you know. Right. And so that's all the frame of reference people have. So when they started hearing these things, if they admitted that these phantom sounds they heard were real, or, or I mean, you know, the, that they were hearing them and they admitted to other people, then they had to admit that they were crazy themselves. And nobody wants to admit that they are crazy. So therefore, they impute them onto, it's the neighbor next door, the person above in the apartment, the person downstairs or whatever. It's not me, because they're real sounds. And if you try and tell them that they're real, they get mad at you. And they'll ask you, can't you hear that uh, racket there? And you listen, and there's nothing. When they say, well, you get your ears checked, because they don't want to admit that it's a possibility that it's all in their head. Now, when somebody asked uh, Dr. Hazel, uh, he had, this is with, about tinnitus, he said, tell me that it's not all in my head. And Dr. Hazel quipped back, he said, yes, it is in your head, but so are your ears. So this is something, a musical ear syndrome, you hear it, but you are not mentally ill. Now, if you want to sort of get an idea, do you have schizophrenia, which is a, you know, I'd be hearing voices, or do you have a mere syndrome. How can you tell the two apart? Very easy. I'm not a I'm not a psychiatrist, so I'm giving you layman's terms. But if you hear what sounds very impersonal, in other words, the TV, the radio, the choir singing, that has nothing to do with you. It's probably MES. If you hear voices talking to you or about you, then it's probably schizophrenia. If you answer back, it's definitely schizophrenia. So that's how you can look at it. That's um, that. That's really how I came to even hear about this. We have a dear friend who's um, 93 and very hard of hearing, and she was telling us about her neighbors who were. Um, she says, "I think they have a group in, and they're practicing uh, for singing at church or something." She, it sounds like hymns, like church hymns. And then recently she was explained, now they're singing Silent Night. And that was like in August. And I said, well, maybe they're practicing for the holidays. For a while, I thought maybe she, that was her neighbors. But the more she talked about it, the more we were a little skeptical. And anyway, she had a family member heard about your work and copied an article of yours that she mailed to her. And she, she said, you have no idea what relief I got to realize I'm not crazy. Everyone was telling me that I'm hallucinating. Oh, well, that's mom, whatever. And she, you gave her so much. And, and, and she said, she said, I've talked to my doctor. They've never heard about it. And I said, we need to get the word out there. So that's why we're doing this. It, it came from Mary. So uh, Mary says hello and sends you a big hug. And she's, she's the reason behind why we're doing this. So thank you from Mary. <laughs> well, nice meeting you, Mary. Glad I helped you, even though I didn't know it at the time. Absolutely. When, and what, what, what happens with with people is there's there's some things that are about musical ear syndrome that really mess you up because 
it sounds so real. I mean, these are hallucinations. They are, the technical term would be non-psychiatric auditory hallucinations. Now, if I say to somebody, I have a non-psychiatric auditory hallucinations, all they hear is the word psychiatric hallucinations to think I'm crazy and that's it. So I coined the term that was totally neutral so that if I say to you, I've got musical ear syndrome, you don't go on and think. The first thing in your mind is not that I'm crazy. The first thing you say, musical ear syndrome? What's that? Almost like it might be something good to have, like you've got an ear for music right. or you've got perfect pitch or something. Sure. And so therefore, people are free to talk about it now. And it since I coined that stigma. term, yeah. it did. Because now there's uh, tens of thousands of websites that use the term musical ear syndrome and people are free to talk about it. Before they would talk to me privately, they wouldn't even tell their spouse. They knew I would understand, so they would talk to me, but nobody else heard about it. But here's the things that really mess you up. Number one, it sounds real. You can't tell it from real sounds. Here's what actually happens. Old memories get shoved into your auditory processing circuits, and thus your brain processes them as though they were real sounds coming right from your ears. And that's why they sound so real. Second, these sounds often have directionality to them. So not only do they sound real, but you know exactly where these sounds are coming from, whether it's over there or over there, or above you or below you. Now let's say you live in an apartment and you hear this loud music that comes from your next door neighbor. Now you know it is that neighbor, not that one on the other side of you, not the one that lives above you, not the one that's below you. And when you have directionality, plus you're hearing something, it's hard to believe. I mean, it's doubly hard to believe that that is not real sound, that is all phantom. And third, sometimes you can actually feel the sounds. You can feel the vibrations because they're so loud. And if it's loud enough, it vibrates the floor. And this really messes you up. Because when you can feel it, you know it has to be real. I mean, at least you think it is. And it's got to be really close to. Let me give you an example. This is a, a true example of uh, one of the many that I know of. An elderly man lived in an apartment. And his landlady lived directly below him. Now, he went to bed every night at 11 o'clock. And every night, at just that time, his landlady put on loud music so he couldn't sleep. Now, he knew that she had some sort of a loudspeaker device that she fastened to the ceiling to vibrate his floor with the loud music. Now, he knew she wanted to drive him buggy so that he'd move out. Now, he was paranoid there, but that was his thinking. And it's logical based on what he knew was happening. So he would go down to her apartment, maybe at two or three in the morning, and he'd pound on the door and tell her to turn that dratted music down. And here the poor lady sound asleep. There wasn't any music. It was totally silent. You see, it was all in his head. Wow. Now, when your senses tell you that the sounds you're hearing are real, because you hear them coming from your ears and they have directionality. You know it's coming from that direction. And it is so loud that it vibrates or shakes your floor. How could you possibly know that it's not true? Your senses are fooling you. But that doesn't mean you're crazy. It means your senses are fooling you. It's all phantom, it's all in your head. And a lot of people, who experience musical ear syndrome are older. Their only frame of reference is that if you're hearing voices, you must be crazy. And it's hard to get through to them because of that. They're always thinking, voices, crazy. So I can't have that. But if you can get through to them and explain that these are not psychiatric sounds, that these sounds are simply musical ear syndrome sounds and that the brains are somehow dumping memories or typically pieces of memories into their auditory circuits where they're being processed as real sounds 
they can get relief. And they get blessed relief when they understand not a problem, it's benign. I'm sure. Now, yeah, now also most people that have MES are hard of hearing in the first place. And just as tinnitus often accompanies hearing loss, so does musical ear syndrome. So that's one reason that a lot of people are both elderly and hard of hearing that have the musical ear syndrome. But furthermore, they may be living in a quiet place. For example, they may have lost their spouse. Now they've got nobody to talk to. And they may be feeling depressed because of that. And that quietness and the depression both can bring on MES. So those are the kind of things that seem to be the most common factors in musical ear syndrome. Now, I want to tell you about another uh, thing that I used to call part of musical ear syndrome, but since then I've realized it's not really. I still call it part, but it's a subgroup, and it's called audio pareidolia. And that is what people that have normal hearing experience. And it's not a hallucination this time, it's an illusion. And what an illusion is, is you hear one thing and your brain interprets it as another. Now your brain is a very wonderful pattern matching device. And I first became aware of this when people said that they heard music out of their furnace or out of the fan in their bedroom. Mm -hmm. And what happens if the fan has a tiny bit of eccentricity, so when it's spinning, it's wobbling a tiny bit, it makes it sound, you might not be aware of it, but there's a little bit of a pattern there. Mm -hmm. And so your brain hears that pattern and it tries to match to the closest pattern it already has in its memory. And the closest match might not be anywhere near close. So the fan is spinning and your friend is hearing uh, Silent Night. Right. Well, Silent Night and a fan are not the same thing. But if that was the closest pattern, that's what you hear. The second the fan goes off, the noise goes away. The fan comes back on, and then you start hearing, your brain starts interpreting a pattern. Now, that's, that's interesting. That's audio pareidolia. And so if you have that, normally you, you're younger, normally you have normal hearing, and there's always that background sound. Now, if you were hard of hearing, like me, you don't, you'd never heard a furnace. So I will never get audio pareidolia because I can't hear. So I'll, if I hear phantom things, it's got to be in my brain. I could be sitting in my car and uh, just, uh, you know, I wait for my wife, uh, she's in shopping or something, and I turn the motor off and I can hear the motor rumbling and... Uh, I could feel the car vibrating because the, the motor is vibrating the car. And yet the, the motor isn't on. The key is in my hand, not in the ignition. I can read the tack. It's zero. The motor is not running. I could still feel the motion. Hmm. I could still hear the motor. Now, in truth, remember, I'm deaf. I can't hear the motor. And so I just know it's all in my head. No big deal. But some people get so scared because they hear this phantom sounds. Absolutely. And the fear, fear factor is so much in there. Like I was sharing with you, our friend, she was so frightened one particular evening. Um, and she, she called the police out a couple of times. And it, it just, it frightened her so much. And that's when everything kind of hit, hit a pivotal that, wall. And that is not <laughs> uncommon. Yep. I'm thinking of another lady. She lived alone in this big house, and every night, about five o'clock, she heard this phantom man. She knew it was a man. She thought he was real. He would open her door and go up to the back steps to her upstairs, and she could hear him walking around up there. She could hear moving furniture around. Now, this little lady, she was quite brave. Several times, she went upstairs. Nothing was ever moved. Never saw him. She changed the locks on her doors twice. She called the cops out twice. They looked all around the, the yard and, and in the house. There was nothing there. And all it was, 
was that she was hearing musical ear syndrome sounds and just in her head, but she went through all of that because she was wanting to know what it was. She went to her doctors and uh, they couldn't figure it out. So they coined a new condition and they called it phantom border uh, syndrome. Boredom. Yes. So she's phantom border because they had this person, phantom person upstairs. And you see, they say that person is got a mental disease. You know, they're mentally ill. They're not. It's just their ears and their brain um, getting the wrong sounds in the wrong place. Mm. And um, that's what happens. That's incredible. I, our, our friend Mary, I, I, keep, I, I keep referring to her, but she's our, my, our only connection with this. But she was wondering if she, she, um, she said a couple of times in the past year, she's had a couple of traumatic or, or stressful times in her life where she felt a little abandoned and whatever, and, and it kind of triggered a flow and she was just really stressed. And she said it was during these times when she would particularly have these episodes of hearing Silent Night and the voices. And she was wondering if there's any connection between that type of stress and this syndrome, or would that just be coincidence? Dental, would you no, say? no, that will be very common because musical ear syndrome is a close relative, I like to say, of tinnitus. Mm -hmm. The difference is, is tinnitus is a unmodulated sound. It's a very simple sound. Whereas musical ear syndrome is a modulated complex sound like singing and voices and music. Right. And both of them can be caused by stress. You think of it, stress, anxiety, and depression, or any combination of those. It can either cause it or make it worse. So that's a very likely uh, what's, what's happening. And well, so if you get your stress under control, and one thing that people find is the best thing, if they read my article that's on the website, or read my book on Phantom Voices, it gives them a sense of relief. Boy, they just get some peace and they realize it's no big deal. And they, they don't have a dreadful brain tumor, which a lot of people think they have, and they're not crazy. And so they get this relief and the stress goes away. And so does their musical ear syndrome. Absolutely. Okay. But I sometimes people don't. I know people have had it for 10, 15 years. Mm -hmm. you know, told me last week, I think it was, that she still has it. We just touched base after all these years. And uh, she knows what it is, doesn't bother her. But one lady told me, she said, if it ever goes away, I'm going to miss it because she likes her music. No kidding. I know, you know, that that's interesting that you mentioned that. And, and thank you for your book. I, I did order that and I gave it to Mary and it's given her so much relief. And just, just knowing that about what it's working it's just it's just um made such a difference in her life so you know thank you for that and um so i you know you talked about several things here and i'm wondering how common this is it, uh, have you identified a certain percentage of the population that has experienced mes people tell you that it's rare doctors that have studied this phenomena there's a couple of them over in england and after 20 years, they had accumulated stories from 30 people. I would get 30 people a week. I have uh, accumulated the stories of about 2,000 people. So you know it's very common. It's not very commonly talked about, but people experience it. When and I talk to hard of hearing people, like I'm talking to a hard of hearing uh, group, and of course, a lot of the people that attend these meetings are older. And I asked, how many people are brave enough to put up their hand and say, I'm hearing these things? Now, I remember, I, before I asked this, I've already explained what musical ear syndrome is and that it's not a psychiatric problem. So that they, it's already diffused that mental issue. Right. And between 10 and 30% of the people present put their hands up every time. So I would say that... Uh, 20% or up to 50% of hard of hearing elderly people uh, hear this from time to time. Not all the time, 
it could be like we say with Mary, it could be a little bit extra stress. You hear it. You get the stress under control. You don't hear it again. That's that's really good to know. And and like we were talking about before, that um, medical practitioners are not trained in this, so they don't recognize it. And with you know, if that is the case as to why it's not more well known, what would you say would be a good way to get it? Uh, other than hopefully we're going to be putting this, these videos out there and more and more people will be um, understanding that. I'm going to be sharing this uh, with um, the medical community. The doctors need to know about it, but you see the way doctors work, if it's not in their psychiatric handbook, it's not a recognized condition. Mm -hmm. I was working with a doctor in England that wanted to get it in there and he tried and he wrote a paper on it and so on, but they didn't put it in. So therefore, it's considered a non-issue. So then off the cuff, if you go into a doctor and, and, and uh, you say, well, I'm hearing voices or phantom music or something, he assumes that you have a mental health issue and he prescribes an antipsychotic. Now, if you're sane and you take an antipsychotic, it just flips you upside down. Now you are, uh, you know, I won't, don't want to call it insane, but your, your brain is messed up. So you don't ever want to take drugs, antipsychotic drugs, because that's going to mess you up. You are normal. It's just you've got a little problem between your memory and your ears, and uh, very common and totally behind. And Dr. Neal, I have a, a little question here I, I've been kind of curious about. Uh, in your book, Phantom Voices, you talk about the Charles Bonnet syndrome. And would you care to elaborate and explain how that relates to MES or if it doesn't relate, how, how those might fit together? Well, that's a good question, excellent question, because very few people have ever heard of Charles Bonnet syndrome, but then very few people have heard of MES, but through my efforts of getting it better known, people know it better. And yet Charles Bonnet syndrome is probably just as common but it's just not commonly talked about. Now, what, what happens, remember we've talked about in musical ear syndrome, your ears are, or your brain is fooling you into thinking that you're actually hearing things that are really memories, mm -hmm. bits and pieces of memories that may be stitched together in any given way. Well, there's an, uh, an identical phenomena goes on with your eyes especially if you start losing your vision, for example, macular degeneration. And what happens then is your eyes start seeing phantom things. So you could say you're hallucinating, but they're non-psychiatric. This is not a mental illness. This is just the fact that your brain is starved for visual information. And because macular degeneration, you see less and less, so it starts making up more and more. And so you might uh, be looking at your living room wall and all of a sudden you see a street scene with cars driving by and buses and people walking on the sidewalk. You might see uh, an idyllic farm scene with pasture and cows in the pasture and so on. You might be uh, a beautiful mountain lake scene. It may be more scary like people peering in your window. Mm. Or it might be somebody, it looks like, um, almost like a silhouette on your wall, cut out and moving. Now, they don't only have to be people images. They could also be uh, random shapes or patterns. You might see your whole wall with a crosshatch pattern or a bunch of balls on it or something. So if you hear that or see that, just realize if you've got vision problems, so you're not seeing as well as you used to, that's Charles Bonnet syndrome, and it's perfectly uh, normal. It's quite common. In fact, they've, uh, uh, statistics show that about 15% of the people that have uh, vision problems like that experience Charles Bonnet syndrome. Oh. But of course, if they go to their doctor, the doctor says, never heard of it. Um, you must be a little bit nuts. I, thank you for explaining that. Um, our friend Mary, again, um, kind of uh, was behind that question. She has shared that she sees people 
looking into her window. Um, so she'll be relieved, I'm sure, to realize that. And I'm just wondering if there are any ways that um, that that people like her can improve that experience. For example, I, she's come to limit, it, limit her vision. Um, she's changed her blinds so she can't see out and people can't see in. Would it be better for her to open the blinds so she can see what's really out there and, and, and give her brain something to focus on so it's not forced to draw on memories to kind of haunt her? Is well, there a, a, I think a, that's an excellent uh, suggestion. I mean, uh, we know that for musical ear syndrome, you want to expose the people to more real sound. So if they wear hearing aids, uh, so they're hearing more, then their brain doesn't have to manufacture as much. Now, for people with vision problems like macular degeneration, it's sort of a one-way street. You know, your vision is going downhill. So it's harder to... You can't, quote, amplify your vision. But what you could do is give your brain as much uh, visual stimulation as possible and hope that that keeps the, your Charles Bonnet more at bay. That, that makes really good sense. And that also reminds me of a question that I just had. Um, this one didn't even come from Mary, but uh, with these experiences of Charles Bonnet or musical ear syndrome, do they occur only during waking hours might they also occur during sleep where you they might appear or seem to be dreams or nightmares i've never heard of that mm -hmm. i would i would think that um it would not be in a dream mm -hmm. and it's rather interesting hard of hearing people like myself we never dream of being hard of hearing in our dreams we just hear Yes. And so in your dreams, you would be seeing. Now, if you are very upset and it's preying on your mind, a lot of times your dreams reflect that. And so you might, but I, I know that people will wake up and they will hear sounds. So um, maybe a phantom sound wakes them up and then they know, uh, you know, then they're hearing it. So maybe they actually do have it and don't remember it. Right, right. Gosh, it could almost be lead into sleepwalking or sleep dreaming, you know what I mean? Where one kind of blends into the other. So. Yeah, because there is, there is sounds like there's hypnagogic and hypnopompic sounds where you, just as you're either falling asleep or just waking up and you hear a sudden louder sounds typically, uh, that's... Um, sort of that idea, but when you wake up, then you're hearing your musical ear syndrome sounds. They even have, uh, as a, um, an aside, they have a syndrome called exploding head syndrome, where you just go, Pew! and you, you hear a very loud sound. It's like an explosion quite often, and it scares you silly. And all it is, is uh, your brain playing tricks on you again. It's not psychiatric, and it's usually just a sudden thing and uh, it's gone. Wow, that's just amazing. I, I, we could go on and on, but thank you so much for addressing all of this. I can't wait to roll this out for more and more people to, to know about this, just such important work.